Hello, everybody. This is Teen Title Talk with Erin and Courtney. This is the podcast where two librarians discuss two YA books every two weeks. Today, we'll be talking about some Prince winners and also I'll probably start with some coronavirus because, you know, this is a season. <laughs> Top of mind. <laughs> So let's begin with, uh, Court, have you had any uh, good COVID dreams lately? I've definitely had some COVID dreams. I don't know if I'd call them good. Okay, let's hear. COVID nightmares? Yeah, I don't know if it's specifically a nightmare. Like, I don't, I might have had this nightmare anyway. It just so happened that people were wearing masks in my nightmare. Mm -hmm. So it could be related, maybe not, but... Let me try and remember the details. It's like I'm in a basement. Oh God, that's already freaky. Well, so and I'm also looking for a house to buy right now. So this is part of the dream as well. Okay, there's an anxiety. So I'm looking through. I'm like in someone else's basement because I'm trying to decide if I want to buy this house. And everybody's wearing masks, and we're all like, "Oh, masks!" <laughs> and then suddenly there's this like attack from the outside and the person selling us this house is like don't worry because we have this like it was some kind of glass force field situation where they could like bring this curtain a glass curtain all the way around us and okay, protect great. us but like it was terrifying and all of the they were like beasts that were coming at us in this basement through the basement windows and like cracks in the basement and they were clawing their way in and we're in this little glass enclosure and they all like I had this I guess it is a COVID dream because I had this knowledge that they were infected okay yes I was gonna say was that COVID <laughs> they were the monsters COVID basically yes and that like all the only thing that was protecting us was this very thin glass shield that is so creepy it was extremely scary did you wake up right then i don't remember how it ended so i probably did wake up and like roll over because that i don't remember it. i don't remember what happened i don't know if they broke through no i would be done then anyway <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those inception situations or something where like you die in your dream do you die in real life <laughs> I know. Oh my God. Oh, well, that's creepy. That's a good one. Yes. Thank you. Have you been having any exciting COVID yes, dreams? I have. And I, um, mine wasn't as scary. Mine was like, just kind of irresponsible. Oh. <laughs> so I remember I was at this, I it was at this Greek restaurant. It was great. It was so great. There was this, they were just making all this wonderful food. And I don't know, I had made friends with the owner who was the bad cop from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And I had watched that earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. She was really nice in this dream. She's like, take this and take that. And she kept trying to give me like some more delicious stuff. Mm. And there was a, some people were talking about a book I wrote and they're like, why don't you have some, a bit, I can't even name any of the stuff. It was just more food. It was delightful. And then I was in the foyer, which was super tiny, like waiting for it. And I realized I wasn't wearing my mask. And then like seven other people were there and they weren't wearing their masks. And I was like, everybody, where's your mask? <laughs> oh my God. Oh, so you were panicked. Yes. All of a sudden, like it came, like all of a sudden I was aware that there was something wrong with what we were doing. Oh and then, God. uh, I remember the lady getting like, well, before you leave, let me get you a vat of oil. And so I was like, <laughs> okay, great. So she had this huge urn of olive oil she was getting, but she was putting garlic in it and some white wines uh oh, vinegar wow making a dressing i don't know a huge vat and then you showed up and <laughs> you were like jason uh is really worried about you being down here i think he's freaking out can you come back to vacation <laughs> and so i was like okay so you and i start to like i was like oh gosh i could go right now so you and i start like walking back to the car and turns out I forgot the oil. Oh. So I head back. I was like, I gotta go get the oil. I, I really need that. She made the whole vat for me. And then I'm heading back. And then 
I'm in there. They offered me some more food. So I <laughs> sat down to have some. Oh, you couldn't help yourself? No. And my, instead of sending you, I guess, Jason sent my friend from kindergarten, Kim Anderson, who oh was gosh. like, Jason's really freaking out. <laughs> I love that Jason can't come himself. <laughs> I know. That's such a Jason move. <laughs> <laughs> or text me. <laughs> I like, I was like, oh, okay. So I walk outside. I'm still not wearing a mask. There was a crowd and a parade happening. Oh no. And I was just like, I got to watch this. And I just <laughs> was so delighted. And the parade was coming down the road. And it was like carnival music. was playing. Oh. And there was part of me that was so joyful about like the thing that was happening. But knowing that the aftermath, I was like, oh, I'm going to get sick. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So it was messed up. So, it, but in your dream, at least you were able to do things and go places that we can't do right, right. now. And it wasn't on, I get, there was, Corona was in there, but there wasn't, it wasn't an anxiety to the point where I had to get out of the dream. I was like, I actually stayed in it. Like I remember Tucker kind of half waking me up and then I was like, I'm going back to the Greek restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling over. <laughs> like, You're like, no, I need the oil. I need to get that dressing. Uh, the dressing sounds great. Yeah. Mm. All right. Let's talk about the Prince Award. They're coming up um in January. January. And uh, every, you know, award season we talk about this, but basically the Prince uh, highlights and awards excellency and YA literature. So what do you think of when you think of like a Prince Award winner? So I think I think we talk about this a lot when award seasons are here and I don't remember what I said last year, but this year, when I think of an award winner, right or wrong, I usually think it's going to be a serious topic mm -hmm. told with grace and creativity. So whether it's fiction or not, the story has to have like some kind of a grip on you, but I don't think it, like it can't be heavy handed. I don't know. I guess balanced and thought provoking might be the way I would define it this year. Nice. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I always look at like what they're looking for. The Prince Committee basically looks at exceptional books and they try to examine and analyze things like story, voice, style, setting, characters, theme, and kind of look for a work that has the entire package, has been fully conceived and realized, and also has the execution component. Like it's very feels like it's, you know, just a, a step above the others. Um, it definitely, I get what you're saying about the serious books. It's not that genre fiction or sci-fi never gets to the awards level, but I do think the awards tend to lean towards serious contemporary or nonfiction or historical fiction titles. Oh, I feel like if you write a historical fiction book, you're already 75% of the way there. <laughs> but maybe that's, maybe I'm jaded. I don't know. I should go back and look at the actual list and see if I can pinpoint like all the, you know, maybe genre fiction and see. Although what was it last year? Was it I don't um, free lunch? Uh, was it? No, I thought we read that for our Yeltsin nonfiction. Oh, maybe that's what it was. And that I think did when, did that win the Yeltsin nonfiction? I thought it might have. I'm not sure though. Um, but yeah. So you read Dancing at the Pity Party. I did. All right. So that has been kind of picked as a contender, kind of talked about. There's a little buzz about this one for a prince. So mm -hmm. tell us about it. What was it about? So actually, this is a book that I've been avoiding because it like triggers my anxiety, but yes. I really love the artwork and I follow the uh, author on Instagram and she's always posting this really beautiful watercolors that she's doing and stuff. So, nice. um, so this is a graphic novel memoir. That's mm -hmm. essentially a timeline of the author's mom's death from cancer oh. from just prior to diagnosis through her passing and then what happens after. So it really has a lot to do with becoming like a motherless daughter going from having this like grounding, loving influence that you like, when you think of the worst thing in the world, you think my mom dying would be the worst thing in the world. And then to suddenly one day, like it happens right. and you don't have her anymore. 
Um, but even though it's really a serious topic, it's told with a lot of humor and a lot of humility. And it's not like a guidebook on how to cope with it. It's more like a loving hug from a friend when you both know that like words just won't cut it. Oh, that sounds so cool. It's really nice. Awesome. Well, what'd you like about it? I think what I loved so much about it was that Tyler's mom really felt real to me. She includes a sample of her mom's handwriting, like from, um, from like a birthday card oh. and uh, a letter that she wrote her. And she draws her with a lot of tenderness, just like the way she's characterized in the drawings is really sweet. And you know, like when you're a kid, if you have a good mom and a good relationship with your mom, you think she's like the most beautiful person in the world. Yes. The smelling, the softest, the comfiest, the smartest, basically like the most wonderful woman in the entire planet. Yes. And Tyler super captures that feeling. She reveals the kind of perfume her mom wore, her mom's obsession with good eyebrows, her mom's creativity and zest for life. Like it's so obvious how close they were, how much she loved her. And just like all these little tiny details build this incredible picture of such like a normal, real person with flaws who's just like doing her best, which is, you know, what I hope I'm doing. And I love that at the end, she makes a point to say that this was really, really hard. Like it was her number one fear and it came true Mm. and she still lived through it. Like she got through it and she's getting through it and it's not easy, but she's okay. And I think that's something that I think all readers will be able to identify with. And I wonder if, as I'm thinking of like the Prince Award, the ability for it to be real and have all those unique details, I wonder if that gives it an edge. Um, you no, know, I wonder. I just think it's hard to mimic reality in some ways when you're writing fiction, you have to really be paying attention to the Mm -hmm. tiny details. And sometimes with memoir, it's like, it's there anyway, because it's a part of you already. Yeah. Oh, it just feels so like intimate. Interesting. Did you have any criticisms? Anything you didn't like? (sighs) I don't know. I mean, this is an awards prediction episode. So, I mean, this is a good book. So I can't think of anything really, except it really made me contemplate my own mortality. Which oh no. <laughs> I never need a reminder of because it's basically my own number one fear. <laughs> that like I will die and my kids will be young and I will leave them like Tyler, which is motherless. And so this is pretty much a confirmation of all of my fears. Like, yes, it can happen and it's really sad. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like the silver lining is that what I was just saying that like the worst did happen, but she got through it with the love of her sisters and her dad and her big, wonderful family and all of her friends. And I hope, you know, I mean, like if that is my fate, which I hope it's not, but if it is like that, my daughters will have that too. And I feel Mm -hmm. like that's hopeful. Absolutely. That sounds great. All right. Well, so not really a dislike except for, you know, reinforcing. Except it made me just like think about. But it's not like you usually need a trigger for that court. Like No, that's true. I do just think about that all the time. Me too. I mean, like, I'm like, oh, I'm, well, yeah, there's death looming ahead again today. <laughs> oh, it's true. <laughs> so bad. I know. I don't even need any. We always have this conversation there. as we head in into the darker season I think. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so what's something special about the title I mean obviously there's tons special can you identify any extra extra yes. special thing oh my god yes. okay. I feel like all that I've been talking about are special things but I definitely think the most special of all the things in this book are the photos that appear at the end and I love them, love them, Mm. love them. It just made it feel so real. It's like two or three pages, like a photo album of just like Tyler and her mom and her sisters and just this like really sweet, loving kind of homage to Mm. her mom. Like she really, really wanted to share with us who her mom really was. 
And I think that those photos just like totally pull it all together. Oh, and awesome. I just love that so much. That's absolutely unique. Um, hmm. All right. Well, that sounds amazing. Can't recommend it enough, except maybe don't read it around Christmas. Maybe, maybe I won't. Wait. I might wait. I may wait till spring to dive into this one. We'll already be yeah. past award season, so it won't help me predict anything, but I'm, I might be okay with that. Yeah, that's okay. You maybe skip this one until you're in a better mental state. Although it does sound like it's full of hope. Like it has, it's just it like- is, that and It is. really, I just love the artwork so much. It's very like unique and it, um, it's almost like cute, but you know, but it's not about a cute thing. So. Right. That sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, and also check her out on Instagram and her sisters, Spencer, and I can't think of what other sister's name is, are all artists and they do like different types of things. So. Okay, cool. One does pet portraits. Oh my God. He sells them on Etsy. <laughs> That's awesome. I know. Oh. All right. So All let's right. talk about yours. What the Black Flamingo? Tell me about it. Yes, the Black Flamingo, the Black Flamingo by Dean Ada. I think is by how you pronounce his name. Um, it's this gorgeous contemporary novel and verse about basically about identity, about being a biracial and gay, and finding a place to call home. Uh, we go along with Michael as he uh, navigates the transition from high school to college, kind of trying to find his place in the world and joy in his own skin. Finally, it's like halfway through the book, he finds the drag society, which happens like once he gets to college and we see he starts to gain this different level of confidence. Um, and that can all, I think can often only come from a support system that believes in you. And that kind of seems like what he's finding when he meets the drag society group. Um, and it's just this lovely book about identity, identity and accepting yourself and being who you are. And it's fierce and wonderfully written. And I, I really enjoyed it. Quick question. Is the drag society what it sounds like? Is it drag queens? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> that needed extra explaining. Yes. I'm just making sure that it's yeah. not like not and drag racing. extra long drags on our cigarettes or something no and they do this like they prepare for this drag show and, and oh my gosh it sounds so fun and they it's just a very open group and you can express yourself any way you want oh my gosh i've been watching got, so much got drag got race theater. i gotta watch this yeah. i gotta read this book you got to, but it's wonderful it was so it did come out in australia last year and it, I believe it was Australia. Um, this year was published in the U.S. So that's why it's, it can be in the award conversation. Mm -hmm. um, because it's newly published in the U.S. Gotcha. So some folks might already be um, familiar. familiar with it. Possibly. So what did you like? This book's one of those rare ones that literally feels like it was basically a memoir. So you know how I was like thinking oh, I love about that. how those details are so clear and unique when it comes from reality. Mm -hmm. Whether this writer is just very capable at that or whether so much of this comes from real life, I'm not sure. But um, it has such distinct details that you're wrapped up in the world so fully you wonder if most of it's entirely true. Oh, I love that. Oh, it's it just it's got a heartbeat. Um, the verse also is gorgeous. I found myself wanting to like dog ear the page. I had the library copy, but I, <laughs> I wanted to dog ear pages. There were some really beautiful, stunning lines and poems and sentiments. And I think it's um pretty amazing, both on characterization and on plot and on the line level as well. So I do think it's hitting all the marks. For I love print. a novel in verse. Yes. And I actually didn't realize it was when I picked it up. I was just like, oh, I want to read this. I've heard, you know, good things. So yeah, I didn't know that until you just said it. Um, now I want to read it even more because I love and that. Good verse. So I think that like it, it's not, it's not just in verse to keep it short. It's, it's just, it, it has to be in verse. There's something. I'm, I'm going to ask an obnoxious question again. Did the poet X win two years ago? Prince, or did that win something else? The Poet X, I think, won the Prince, yeah. Yeah. And that was a novel in verse. A novel in verse. Yeah. So do you think they'll do another novel in verse so that soon? That was not last year. Maybe. I mean, I don't think they can, 
compare you can't it. I don't think they can compare it to other years. I think it has to stand on its own as the best. Gotcha. Was there anything you didn't like about it? If I had to choose, and this isn't about the text or anything, but the cover of the American version, I don't know. I, I just didn't feel like it was doing it any favors. I have to look it up because I don't know what it looks okay, like. Okay, so it's, let me like glance at it. Um, I'm, I'm only seeing the Australian version, so that doesn't really help me. Um, it's The problem I didn't like about it was it was a kid on the front, and I don't, a lot of times I don't like covers with people on it because I like oh, I see that it. In person on my own, and mm -hmm. I don't like to have that, like, forced imagery of someone i also felt mm. like it very much seemed like it was selfie made and and that there was so much depth to this person Is the character like looking over his shoulder with yeah. like a boa type thing yes yes i see it but that seems to me that style seems to be i don't know if you've looked at your new shelf lately but i feel like 90 percent of the new books have this like like a big image of a person mm -hmm. like right on it with like nothing in the background just like this very similar sort of like drawing right. style right yeah i, don't I think know. it's just the style right it now it would be i just didn't i don't know i just felt like there was so much depth and passion and complexity to the character i know that's really hard to get in one image so it's it's kind of not fair to criticize it because you has already won other awards. Yes, yes. Bottom line. Stonewall Book Award winner. That was, was that, that must have been last year. Mm hmm So I don't think the cover does it justice. I'm just saying. <sighs> That's fine. I mean, fair enough. Right. What, what would you say is something special about this title? Okay, I'm going to go with two different things for something special. I think a representation of the character's ability to maintain his individuality and find his worthiness despite negative feedback from those around him was unique. Like, he was like a rock in the river. He was able to maintain his dignity and just be who he was. Like, he would get criticism from high school kids at times, but it wouldn't make him, it like, it didn't seem to set up too much of a negative dialogue in his mind. It was mm -hmm. more like, how do I navigate this? Mm. Which was so interesting and kind of fresh. Um, it did cool. So he didn't feel like beaten down. down. But, he was right. just like, okay, well, how can I? Right. Navigate. Like he went up and was like, talk to this, ask this guy out who wasn't gay, but he did it like out loud in the middle of the hall. And <gasps> oh my gosh. I was so impressed by like the, the, I can't even pride. ask anyone. I think the pride was there in a subtle way, even though he was grappling with identity. The pride was there. That's awesome. I loved that. I think it's a message that's worth sharing again and again, and just enjoying and being happy for the person, and you know, like celebrating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also loved that it took place between high school and college, I, or like the a leg in both worlds. It's just this huge transition for most people. Uh -huh. Most YA tends to hang around in high school, not bridge both you know, high school and college. And it did very seamlessly. And I can't think of a recent read that had a foot in both worlds. I thought that was very interesting. And I think it should be depicted more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be another one. I also loved the relationship with the mom. I thought that was so special. He like calls her mommy. Was she a good mom? Oh, she was such a good mom, single I mom. That. I love that. And so he called her mummy even when he was in college. He was just like, mm. oh, my beautiful mummy. Like, it was just, I just loved that. Oh, I love that too. I really want to read it. It's a great book. I really it sounds like a feel-gooder. It's great. Uh, and you know yeah. what I realized is because sometimes I'm always like, oh, contemporary. And then I end up com picking contemporary. Mm -hmm. I just really like good characters. And I think that sometimes contemporary spends more time on creating a really good character. Than... Yeah, I agree. Because they don't have to do a lot of world building. So right. There's not really as much focus. world building or action that they have to throw in. So right. you'll have that good, like, interesting people. And I, I really enjoy that. So. Oh, next time I'm going to have some interesting people to talk about. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm reading some contemporary fiction right now. Mm. All right, let's turn to book buzz. What's up in the book world? I know we didn't get to record last time because of crazy schedule. 
and I wasn't feeling that great. Um, so this might, mine is a little dated. I don't know if yours is, or if you pulled new stuff, but you know, no, this, I didn't pull anything new. So mine's this, like a two and a half or three week old news. Okay. All right. Well, go for it. What are you looking forward to? So something exciting that's coming up in 2021 is the collaboration between Danielle Clayton, Tiffany Jackson, Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Ashley Woodfolk, and Nicola Yoon. Oh, yeah. This is a novel called Blackout, which is told from six different perspectives. Right. This sounds amazing. I think it sounds amazing. Jason Reynolds tweeted about it, and um, that's how I found out about it. And it just, like, huh, it sounds so cool and different. Yeah. And it feels good knowing there are good things coming. A vaccine and this book. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's great. We can all use some good news. Love it. Um, also, Angie Thomas's prequel to The Hate You Give is coming out in January. So we do not have long to wait for that. Interesting. Yeah, it's called Concrete Rose, which I think will be really probably super good, but that's also probably also heart wrenching. Yeah. Right. And my third good thing is that book sales are up this year because people are bored and they're buying a lot of books. Love it. So YA titles are up like 18 and a half percent for fiction and 36 and a half percent for nonfiction. That's great. Which is crazy. So maybe the next book you write should be nonfiction. Well, that would be fine since that's kind of what I'm writing now anyway. Well, with, good. With all the genealogy. <laughs> That's true. That's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So tell me your buzz. I actually had more buzz than I thought I did. That's great though. These are good. I didn't know about a couple of them because I've also, I feel like it's hard to keep up right now because we're all like playing catch up constantly. Mm -hmm. so it's good to go over. Um, I was, of course, so National Book Awards finalists came out and yeah. I was of course bummed that Tracy didn't win. Yes. But I was happy to see Case and Calendar take the cake on a book I hadn't read and am excited to read. Um, yes. We've reviewed Case and Calendar's books here before. I've been enjoying following their career. Big congrats. I'm excited to read this one. It's called King and the Dragonflies. I keep seeing it on the shelf and I keep meaning to pick it up. Looks so. interesting. Um, okay, so then this, I had this book buzz that I saw that was different than yours. You're saying the book world is doing really well and I saw a different buzz that was like, really depressing for the YA book. Oh, okay, well, give us the depressing news. <laughs> so, but I, I, I think it's kind of in the middle of both things. So um, there was a, a great little vlog that came out that was talking about quote unquote death of YA. Alexa Dawn has a good recap of the issues, but it basically boiled down to that it wasn't COVID, but the YA book market got super oversaturated for quite a while. And now certain imprints recently shuttered, like Jimmy Patterson Presents. Mm. And there was a, a Simon & Schuster imprint as well. She basically is saying that it's a young genre. It moved too quickly. And what feels like dying at the moment is really just a course correction. <laughs> So I've got to say, it actually makes me feel a little bit better about my YA crashing and burning in 2015. Yeah, there you go. It's just like an oversaturated market. <laughs> We're probably other contributing factors besides that, but, um, you know, it's nice to dream. Um, so no, I, that was definitely the only reason you went to Greece. Thank you, Court. And I loved going to Greece. At least I had a great trip. You had a, you, you loved it so much journey. that you had a dream about it. You have to enjoy the journey because you never know if like, the book will ever succeed. So it's really just writing it that should be enjoyable. <laughs> um, I think that's great advice. Thank you. I thought long and hard about that. So anyway, why is not dying? The book business is doing really well. I think people got really excited and like people were opening doors and imprints, et cetera, quickly and signing books quickly. And now everybody's kind of like, let's reflect a little bit and make this really calculated. And it will, it, it will just become a more normal section of the book market. Mm. So that'll be good. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately that will be healthier. Um, I saw a really fun graphic novel saga that was announced in PW Children's Bookshelf. Mm. It said that Lily Kessinger at HMH had acquired world rights to the worst Ronin by Maggie Takuda Hall. Mm. And um, it would be illustrated by Faith Schaefer. And it tells the story of two women, samurai, one running from the grief of her past and the other hoping for glory. Whoa. Publication is scheduled for 2024. 
Oh, shoot. That's far away. I know, but it sounded really cool. And it's a saga. I just like it when I see graphic novel saga, women warriors, you know, it's cool. That sounds very cool. But okay, so just like a publishing question. Mm -hmm. That is kind of far in the future. Is that how long it takes to write? Well, no. Well, but if it's illustrated, it takes longer because you have. Well, that's true. You have to make all the, if however she illustrates paintings yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's it true. Takes a long time. Um, I know picture books usually take longer, but mm. it also depends what shape it is when it's bought. Is it like a synopsis or a proposal or is it the whole thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Mm, interesting. All righty. Well, that's a wrap on today's podcast. Did you know that you can now ask your smart speaker to play Teen Title Talk? Just say, Alexa, can you play the Teen Title Talk pod podcast on TuneIn? Say it slowly and clearly, and I'm sure she will play it for you. Wherever you are listening, thanks so much for joining us. And don't forget to drop us a line anytime by emailing us at teentitletalk at gmail.com. We haven't gotten a lot of emails on that. So just send us an email because we would love to hear from you. Yeah. Why not? What else are you doing? What else are you doing? Tell us about your scary COVID dreams. Oh my God. Yes, please do. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for Teen Title Talk. This podcast is brought to you by the Dairy Public Library and Dairy Cam, Dairy Community Access Media, empowering independent voices. Wherever you are listening, if you enjoyed it, please be sure to rate and review. Our theme, which you haven't heard in a long time, was created and performed by Banded Starling. Until next time. Bye.